If you want more information, then visit StandUpForTheTruth.com. Now, back to Mike LeMay. Our final segment with Pastor Carl Gallup's new book, already a bestseller, provocative, quite interesting. It's called Gods of Ground Zero. You can get it at Amazon or any fine bookstore. Carl, you've got a chapter in the book uh, we, we talk about where you talk about categories of sin. Now, we know that all sin is offensive to God, but are there particular sins that are more devastating to us as humans than others? You know, actually, yes. Now, now I, I, I want to be very clear, and I want our audience to hear this. I, again, we're doing a radio interview today, and that's a lot different than sitting down with the book and reading the couple of chapters and looking at all the notes and the references and the scholarly attestations. So it's easy for people to mishear or misunderstand what I'm getting ready to say. Uh, but what I'm saying is what the Bible says, and it's exactly, it's just right there in the Scriptures. So the bottom line is this. Um, when we think of sin and sins, we, 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 we often kind of misappropriate those terminologies. Um, we, we, we don't go to hell for a sin that we commit. We go to hell because of our sin nature. Now, when our sin nature is covered under the blood of Christ, then the grace and mercy of, of the Lord God is shown to us through the blood of his Son. And we are set aside, we're set apart, we are justified, we are vindicated because God says so, because we've come under, under the blood of Jesus. But do we still have a sin nature? Yes. is tempered by the Holy Spirit. We're convicted by the Holy Spirit. We're guided into truth and righteousness by the Holy Spirit through the sanctification process. But I've been a Christian for a long time. You guys have too. Are any of us without a sin nature? Are we without temptation? Are we without making m sinful mistakes or sinful, or not even mistakes, of sometimes doing things that are outside of God's Word and we know it, but then we are immediately convicted and we come back? Of course we still have a sin nature. Paul talked about it. You know, the things I don't want to do, I do. The things I do want to do, I don't do. I Oh, what a wretched man I am, but, but thanks be to God through Jesus Christ who gives me the victory. So so he, he admits all of this. Okay, so I tell people all the time, look, you know, people say, well, you know, if I smoke cigarettes, am I going to hell? I say, smoking a cigarette doesn't send you to hell. Now, it makes you smell like you just came from there. Okay? <laughs> but, 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 but it's your sin nature, your sin nature. Okay, now watch. So in the midst of it, then, we deal with sin. In other words, we deal with sins of the flesh. The Bible speaks. The Bible warns Christians about sins and sins of the flesh, and sins of, uh, against other people, and, 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 you know, and, and treating one. Don't lie. Don't, don't disparage each other. Don't, don't, uh, don't steal. I mean, these come from the commandments, but the New Testament tells us that. To Christians, to the church, don't gossip. Uh, you know, don't, don't, don't destroy each other. But then we get to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we hear these words. And flee from sexual immorality, for all other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now, folks, guys, the Word of God says all other sins with an S a person commits are outside the body. How many are all? <laughs> all? All. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Flee from that sin. All right. Now, I mentioned, I show in the book that sexual sin goes all the way back to the Old Testament, comes all the way through to the New Testament, finds its way into the book of Revelation, where it is heavily and heartily condemned again, and not only in some of the letters to the seven churches, but in the very last couple of chapters, speaking of who are outside the gates of the city. And it speaks of those who are sexually immoral, and of course that, that refers to those that are not even under the blood of Jesus, and they just, they just wallow in sexual sin, sexual immorality, as a part of their regenerate nature. But yet even Christians can 
fall to sexual sin in people who claim to be Christians. That's why the Bible, that's why Corinthians is written to the Christians at the church at Corinth and said, now look, you still have a sin nature. You need to, listen, you, you, you know, the Holy Spirit of God is going to sanctify you, and he's going to help you along the process of life and, and dealing and cleaning your life up. But in the meantime, church, flee from sexual immorality, because that's a sin against your own body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you. Flee from that. You are bought with a price. You're not your own. I mean, this, this, this language is very, very emotional. And so I show in, this, in, the, in my book that the mention of sexual sin is the most pervasive sin mentioned in the entirety of the Bible. So when we get to Corinthians, it says, oh yeah, there's a special class of sin that degradates the soul. Now let me just read just a few commentary quotes about this, and then it'll make a profound point. Just to show people again, I'm not, I'm not pulling this out of my back pocket. So Barnes Notes, which has been around for a long, long time, he says, and on commenting on this particular passage of Scripture, says, perhaps no single sin has done so much to produce the most painful and dreadful diseases, weaken the Constitution, shorten this life, etc., etc., etc. Other voices like gluttony and drunkenness do this also, and all sin has some effect in destroying the body, but it is true of this sin in an imminent degree no single sin has done so much to produce so much devastation. Now, wait a minute. How about eating a piece of fruit from a tree in the garden? See, uh, let me read another commentary, the expositor's commentary. Sins of the flesh engage and debauch the whole person. They proceed out of the heart. They touch the springs of our very being in the highest degree, and they defile the man like no other sin. I can keep going. Cambridge Bible says, For it is the violation of the fundamental law impressed upon man from the beginning. Wow. That commentary took that whole idea all the way back to the beginning. That sexual sin was the most degrading of all sins. That brings the most destruction than anything else. Eliot's commentary. All the other sins may profane only the outer courts of the temple, but sexual sin penetrates with its deadly foulness into the very holy of holies. It is the most dreadful of sins. And I, it just goes on and on and on. So the bottom line is, guys, isn't it interesting? What dominates the headlines of today's world now that the whole world is connected through internet instantaneous communication 24 7 news cycles what dominates it oh israel the middle east jerusalem the temple mount sexual perversion sex robots uh sexually transmitted diseases through the roof pornography industry going crazy pornography addiction the destruction of marriage home and family by sexual sin and perversion the destruction destruction of denominations and faith systems, the Roman Catholic Church, even the evangelical community, sexual sin at the highest levels from the pulpit, sexual perversion, sexual sin. Do you guys get it? It's mm -hmm. been right there in the Word of God from the beginning, from the beginning, all the way through to some of the last words of the book of Revelation. But we don't want to talk about it and it's not talked about from pulpits, and it's not in our Sunday school literature, although the Bible is pervasive. It's the most pervasively mentioned sin in the Bible. Yet we never talk about it at church. Or if we do, it's just really brushed over. Why? Because it infects the hearts of almost everybody sitting in a pew. And we don't want to upset people because they'll leave and they'll take their money and we can't pay for our buildings. Guys, this is the obfuscation process that's going on. From the Garden of Eden to the end of the Word of God, we are confronted with our nature, with why this world is in the mess it is, why the focus of Satan's attack is upon Jerusalem and that Temple Mount, why he's got it engraved on the side of the mosque. This is the foundation of the Garden of Eden. Well, what was Satan doing in the Garden? He was trying to take it from God. Isaiah 14 says his heart is, I will ascend to the Mount of Assembly. I will be like the Most High God. I will be the God of God. I will sit upon the throne of God. 
That's what all of this is about. That's what all of life is about. It's what the world's about. It's what the rise and fall of empires are about. It's what the whole Middle East debacle is about. And one of the ways that Satan is pol- continually polluting the creation that God made is through sexual perversion. That's what the Bible says. Fascinating. Pastor Carl, um, I really wanted to get this in because it's just something that I've been curious about regarding angels. And you address in the book uh, what you call the myth of angels can't die. And you say the Bible pointedly states otherwise. Yeah. Now, can you explain this to us? And I know uh, yeah. we could probably talk a whole lot more about angel worship and all this other, but yeah. angel, can, can angels die? Do they die? Yeah, we talk about, I talk about angel worship in the book, too. Everything, everything you're asking me, brother. Yeah. So, yeah, but listen, uh, absolutely. In fact, now, it, it depends upon when you, when, what, what your definition of death is, because when we get all the way to the end of the Bible, we read about the great white, white throne of judgment and the lake of fire, and it is called, what's the lake of fire called? This is the second death. death. Okay, so so if you can if you de, de, if you define the lake of fire as death, now what does that mean? They're burned up; they never exist again, or is that just a place where they're completely separated from from God forever and forever and forever in a horrific place? I, I, we don't know. It means death, literally, it, regardless of what actually happens in the very, 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 very end of everything. It it, it literally means no second chances, total separation total perhaps total annihilation by the time it's all over with but that's 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 up to god but the bottom line is death all right now can angels die as a matter of fact let me just give you a couple examples of of god talking to satan and then i'll tell you some things jesus said about this in ezekiel 28 well no 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 let's go back to the garden of eden <laughs> genesis 3:15 so God brings Adam, Eve, and Satan before him. He says, Adam, you're going to toil in the ground by the sweat of your brow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Eve, uh, you know, you, 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 one, one of the biggest things is, 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 is in childbirth now. It will be with pain and labor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then he looks at Satan. And by the way, the book of Revelation says that the ancient serpent was Satan. It's in Revelation 12. It's in Revelation 20. The ancient serpent is a metaphor because in Revelation 12 and 20, it goes on to speak very metaphorically about that serpent and that, quote, dragon. Those two terms are used synonymously. But over and over it says, but this is Satan. It is Satan. That's who was in the Garden of Eden. It was not a walking, talking snake. The Bible tells us, not Carl Gallup's, that it was a metaphor. But the deal is that what we discover is, I'm sorry, somebody just walked in the office. What was the question you asked me? I, I want to finish because I'm right there. Oh, sure, sure. But angel, um, the, the, yes. the, can angels die yes. or do they die? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, it distracted me. So the point is, now that we know that Satan was the one in the garden, let me tell you what God said to Satan in Genesis 3.15. He looked at him. He said, now for you, here's your judgment. From the womb of a woman will come a seed that will crush your head. Guys, if your head is crushed today, you're dead, right? One would think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He will crush your head. You'll bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. See, the first thing God tells Satan in the garden is how he's going to die and why he's going to die. But he doesn't tell him who's going to do it or when it's going to happen. The rest of the Bible is Satan trying to figure that out. Hold on. <coughs> Excuse me, had to, had, got choked. But then you go to Ezekiel 28. In Ezekiel 28, God says to Satan, you were in the garden. You were my anointed cherub. And we find out that word cherub in Ezekiel chapter 10 is, is a living, it's one of the living creatures. We get to Revelation and we discover <coughs> that the living creatures are before the throne of God guarding the holiness of Excuse me, I have to take a drink. <clears throat> Guarding the holiness of God's throne. See, Satan doesn't want this revealed. <laughs> but watch. <laughs> and he said, you were in the garden. You were my guardian cherub. And he says, you were full of perfection and beauty and wisdom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then he said, but I cast you out as a profane thing. That word profane in Hebrew is kalal, halal. It's, it's really, really bad. I mean, it just means he desecrated it. It wasn't. Uh, Eve accidentally tricked into eating a piece of fruit. That's metaphorical. But anyway, but he goes on to say, 
and I cast you out as a profane thing. And then that section ends by saying, and I will eventually, I will reduce you to ashes in the sight of the nations. Listen to this. And you will be no more. Mm -hmm. So there's another sentence of death and destruction. If you are burned to ashes, guys, you don't exist. And God said, and you will be no more. When we get to the New Testament, we hear Jesus talking about death and hell being prepared for Satan and his angels. When we get to the New Testament, we, we hear about the great white throne of judgment and the second death and Satan and the beast are thrown into the lake of fire. By implication, so are the angels that sinned, because that's where Jesus said they're the, they've got the same destruction that Satan does. And then we read Second Peter and Jude talking about the angels that are being held in prison for the final day of judgment because they stepped over a line that God said, no, you can't do that. And apparently it's tied all the way back to the Garden of Eden and right before the flood because those scriptures mention that, and they mention Sodom and Gomorrah and the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. All of that's in the scriptures, and all of it points to the destruction and annihilation and the being no more, the crushing of the head, the burning and reducing, reducing to ashes. And I guess a lake of fire would do that, guys. I would think um, so. Yeah, and so there, there's the answer. I mean, it's, again, it's right there in the Bible. So, see, we think, now, obedient angels do not die. Humanity suffers death because we partnered with Satan in the garden. But because of, we're under the blood of Jesus, the Bible says, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says, that our divine nature will be restored to us. And it clearly says because we have, and I'm going to paraphrase, but because we're under the blood, because we're, we've believed the word. So our divine nature will be restored like it was in the beginning. Well, does that mean we're God? No, no. Divine nature means we were like Adam and Eve. We won't die. Mm. Revelation 21 says, behold, no more death, no more pain, no more crying. Wipe oh. every tear. I'll live with you. You'll live with me like it was in the beginning. All things will be made new. Again, our divine nature. So obedient angels, they don't die. Humans who come under the blood of Jesus, we don't die. But who's thrown into the lake of fire representing the second death? Not just Satan and his angels, but all of those whose names are not in the book of life. Carl, I've got to, I've got to cut it off right there. I am up against a hard break. Carl Gallup's the book, Gods of Ground Zero, connects some interesting dots and raises some great questions and study issues lord bless you car we'll have you back again real soon my friend thank you i appreciate it I enjoyed it. for thousands of years mankind has debated how creation began ancient texts tell us the story but today the real message behind the pivotal account of the garden of eden has been obfuscated and lost that is until now World-renowned author Carl Gallops digs up the hidden truths from the book of Genesis to finally give back the knowledge that was lost to the world. Find out what really happened in the Garden of Eden, what Jesus taught about Eden on the cross, and how the conflict between Jesus and the gods of antiquity is about to erupt on planet Earth, fulfilling biblical prophecy. In the new book, Gods of Ground Zero, this explains everything.